Welcome to another Innovation in Workwear series. I'm joined by Ian Summers, Vice President of Footwear, Industrial Workwear and Industrial Safety at Marxy. Morning, Ian. Morning, Adam. Thanks very much. So we're, uh, we're here this morning uh, talking to uh, Steve Schofield. And uh, Stephen is a um, entomologist with the Department of uh, National Defense, but in today's uh, in today's uh, discussion, he's uh, he's here assisting us in understanding the um, the risk of ticks in the workplace, and uh, and how we might be able to address that. Stephen is also, um, in my opinion, um, one of of only two tick experts in Canada, and uh, we've been uh, fortunate enough to be working with uh, Stephen for a few years now. Um, in, uh, in bringing um, awareness uh, to Canadians um, on ticks and also um, in helping uh, Marks introduce um, tick repellent, tick and mosquito repellent on um, clothing. So morning, Stephen. Hey, how's it going, Ian? Good, good. So uh, we were just talking, you were saying that, um, that uh, you've uh, found ticks um, on your dog already in the uh, Ottawa region, right? Yeah, in the Ottawa it, region. absolutely. So we, we seem to be having a, a nice spring, uh, which obviously given the, the situation with SARS-CoV-2 COVID is awesome um, because we're limited to doing things outside really. Um, so we want to get outside, but we're also seeing ticks and, and uh, ticks are a little bit different than mosquitoes in that, well, they're a lot different than mosquitoes, to be frank. They don't have wings, for one thing. They have eight legs. But uh, they, for example, um, will take advantage of good weather. Um, unlike mosquitoes, who sort of have to develop a little bit in the spring, uh, quite often, uh, ticks, in particular adult ticks, uh, they just hang out in the winter, and they try to survive the winter. And so if the snow disappears, and it warms up a little bit, they're going to be out looking for you. So right now, uh, even in, in March of this year, as a matter of fact, I, I pulled two dogs, two, not two dogs, two ticks off of my dog. And, and that certainly is, is... I thought I was envisioning this big tick when you pulled two dogs oh, off of a tick. They are. They're, 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 they're about that big out here. In Ontario, we make big ticks. Um, but we, we, we pulled a few ticks off the dog. And that's earlier than we would expect. And it certainly highlights that uh, the season for ticks can vary from year to year, depending on, on what the temperature is doing, depending on fluctuations, et cetera. Now, there is no doubt that we have peak seasons. Uh, we'll see more adult ticks as we move through May and we move into June. Uh, that's their peak season. And we see that again for the adults, the big ticks, and we can come back to their life cycle if you, if you want to. We'll see it again in the autumn, uh, even into October, sometimes in November, uh, as long as snow is, is not on the ground. Now, to be clear, the ticks I'm talking about right now, uh, because of my background, I'm interested in preventing disease, uh, are the ticks that transmit the, the germs, the, the bacteria that cause Lyme disease. Of course, there's other ticks out there as well, and, and no one likes being bitten by ticks because they're creepy. Uh, but probably today, my emphasis will be on, on, on the ticks that, that we're worried about, specifically, of course, for Lyme disease. And what kind of, uh, what's the, there's a lot, sometimes there's a lot of confusion around which types of ticks, um, you know, carry uh, Lyme disease or you can contract Lyme disease from. Can you just explain the difference between the black-legged and the other ticks out there? So the Lyme tick, there's actually two different species and essentially they're twins in Canada, although they do things a little bit differently. Uh, we have one in the east and, and moving into central Canada called Exodes scapularis or the black-legged tick. Uh, the deer tick, if you will. Uh, and we're very creative in the West. We have another one called the Western black-legged tick. So effectively, they look the same. Now, an important point, I think, is that the Western black-legged tick has been there for some time. It's been out in BC doing its thing for actually a, a decade, however long. Um, we don't have to go back that far in time. But it's not actually all that good at, at, at transmitting uh, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease for a number of reasons. Uh, we're worried about it. We watch it. We want to prevent its bites. But it's, if you will, the less dangerous of the two ticks. Uh, the new kid in the block, or perhaps not so uh, new anymore, it's been here um, in terms of an expanding range for certainly a decade, is, is the eastern black-legged tick. 
uh, Exodia scapularis, uh, the deer tick. And it's much better at transmitting Lyme disease, most importantly because it has or is more likely to be infected with the, 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 the bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease. And the thing about this tick, um, apart from it being creepy, is that it's been expanding in terms of its range over the last number of years. Uh, so it was at one point in, in, in Canada, uh, limited to, if you will, certain areas in the far south along the border with the United States. Uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, that's been changing and it's been changing substantially. Uh, so we have, if you will, this maybe not so slow creep of this tick uh, into new areas such that, for example, it, it can be found in many areas of Southern Ontario, uh, obviously, it can be found in the Maritimes, it can be found in Quebec, we can find it in southern Manitoba, etc. And we fully expect uh, this expansion in the range of the tick uh, to continue to occur. Um, if you want, we could touch on why we think it's expanding. Um, although, in some ways, that's immaterial because it's here and it is expanding. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, the, the, what's interesting is when we started um, in 2008 um, to uh, bring uh, a technology um, to market, um, obviously with lots of approvals and processes through um, PMRA and Health Canada. Um, you know, when we started that, ticks were not the topic. The, the topic of discussion at, and of the times was mosquitoes when we were worried about West Nile. Um, and in this short time, um, it's completely flipped, and and now protecting people against Lyme disease is uh, is a, it's a huge issue. Yeah, that that's completely true, Ian. I think that's an important point, and and it highlights something. I know eventually we're going to get into the clothing uh, and and what you have done, which is which is rather amazing. Uh, the the movement of ticks in, in, into Canada, uh, I guess was anticipated, but it probably happened a little bit quicker than we thought. And the reason they've moved in, and I think it's worth it, maybe it is worth exploring this a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. sure. in, involves, for example, uh, things are probably a little bit warmer, uh, but it was probably anyhow inevitable because we're changing the way we, we use land. And so for these ticks to survive, they need a few things. Uh, one of the important things they need are hosts and there's certain types of hosts, so things that they normally feed on. They don't normally feed on us. We're, we're what's called a dead end host. Yeah, we give them a bit of blood, but, but the pathogen uh, can't come from us into them. So the question is, where do they get the pathogen? Well, they have three life stages. They have little itty bitty life stages called larva and nymphs. Uh, those two lar life stages feed on small mammals, uh, things like mice or chipmunks, what have you. And when they're feeding on those small mammals, they can pick up the pathogen. And so once they pick up the pathogen, they become dangerous. Uh, now, as they get older, they can feed on us as nymphs or they can feed on us as adults. And in these older stages, if they do, they can transmit the pathogen to us, uh, which can cause Lyme disease. But norm nor more normally, what they will do is they'll feed on another big mammal, something like deer. Indeed, that's why they're sometimes called deer ticks. Deer are very important. Now, deers don't harbor that pathogen, but what they really do, and this is very important, is they give the mama ticks a whole bunch of blood to make a whole bunch more baby ticks. So deer help to increase populations of ticks and then your chipmunks and your squirrels help to infect all of those ticks. So as we've moved into, if you will, environments where we have more trees, maybe farmland uh, isn't necessarily always used. You have more fence rows, you have more deer. You have those conditions that are supportive of tick populations. And if you warm things up just a little bit, then Ticks are here to stay. So that's kind of why they're here now. Um, and they're not going away. Yeah, it's, um, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I believe the deer population in Canada is very healthy um, compared to what it might have been uh, 20 years ago or so. And, um, and, and squirrels inside of uh, suburb, sub, suburbia, right, and uh, suburban areas. Um, and, and now those areas are getting to be very mature with, with large trees that were planted 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so there's a, we continue to create an environment. Um, it seems a healthy environment for them. Absolutely. So, so the environment that we love to explore is the very environment 
that is conducive to making ticks. Uh, and it's not necessarily a, a completely, it's not absolutely, it's not a completely rural phenomenon. It is also a phenomenon where you have, for example, as you just described, uh, mature tree rows, uh, edges of habitat. So the paths we like to walk upon are the same paths, for example, at the edge where you might find chipmunks, mice, uh, where deer wander. And certainly as we you know, you start to enjoy nature more, I think we're starting to re-explore. You know, we like seeing deer, we like seeing wildlife, but those conditions are also supportive of ticks. Uh, and ticks, you know, do well uh, because of that. So, so we have, to an extent, supported the conditions whereby we have more ticks and we want to explore those very same areas because that brings us joy. So the question is, how do we manage to explore those areas while at the same time preventing tick bites. So, so you're absolutely right. Uh, deer populations are healthy. Sometimes they're in our backyard. We have forested areas, all of those things coming together, if you will, set the stage for, for having uh, Exodes scapularis or the deer tick. Yeah, it's, uh, so um, you mentioned, um, I think we both did actually, the, the um, uh, protective clothing and ways you can protect yourself from ticks. And um, the, uh, it took a um, very long time to get approval to bring that into uh, uh, Canada uh, at the same time that we were trying to get approval to uh, introduce it to the public. You were also working on, on helping uh, the military um, uh, get the clothing. And again, that was more for mosquitoes at the time than it was for, um, for ticks being traveling out of the country and in different, in different areas. So the, um, the general public um, now has... Uh, an opportunity to protect themselves with, with clothing. Um, and that um, it's a technology from uh, Burlington Mills. Um, it's called No Fly Zone. And it's applied to um, clothing in a, in a very safe and permanent way and not harmful to, to a wearer. Um, the, the one issue that, that exists in the, in the market and why we're gonna hear today is that the, um, the, working, the worker um, doesn't have the same protection. So the type of clothing that's been designed is, is designed more for casual wear and outdoor and hiking and, and enjoying the outdoors. Whereas the worker needs, uh, has much different requirements in the way of materials and types of clothing. So maybe just um, um, talk a little bit about there and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and tell you what we're kind of doing on the on the work side. Well, well that sounds great and, and let's start out with like showing I'm wearing one of your your, your shirts and it it looks apart from the fact that I'm good looking it looks good on me. <laughs> um, so so uh, I'm going to take you know, look I just got myself out of focus I'm going to take a, a little bit of a uh, step backwards and, and talk a little bit about the military now I mean I'll be clear I'm not representing the military today but that's where a lot of my knowledge comes right. from. And I think you raise a, a really important point in terms of the occupational setting. Um, am I still out of focus, guys? For you? Yeah, you're good. Okay, just because it looks a little bit funny here. Okay, so you've raised a very important point in terms of this occupational focus. So what we're talking about is actually clothing that has permethrin treated or treatment placed into it. And, and permethrin, uh, is a repellent. Now we're more normally accustomed to repellents that we apply to our skin. But in effect, they do the same thing. They put off, whether it be mosquitoes or whether it be ticks, they don't like, if you will, the taste of it, the feel of it or whatever. And so at the end of the day, what these things do are they prevent bites. And of course, we don't want nuisance bites. No one likes being bitten by ticks or being bitten by mosquitoes, probably more so ticks, they're creepy. But the backstory for me in terms of what we're thinking about uh, and travelers or military personnel, but let's focus on military personnel for, for, for a little bit in a general sense, is that we're particularly concerned about the transmission of pathogens. And in this respect, if you can prevent bites, you can prevent transmission of pathogens. Now, circling back to that occupational aspect that you mentioned again, of course, the military population is a population for which there is occupational exposure. Uh, so we're worried, for example, when we deploy people overseas about diseases like malaria, diseases like dengue, or even tick-associated diseases. And I have to say that the first development of this approach, this permethrin-treated clothing, was by the military, in this case, the U.S. military, because uh, they well recognize that 
yeah, sure, you can use topical repellents on skin, but there's other areas of your body, for example, clothing that mosquitoes might bite through or that, for example, ticks might crawl behind. Mm -hmm. And so the approach has always be, been to use an integrated program to prevent bites. So topical repellents on exposed skin and treated clothing to prevent bites. Now, for treated clothing, what is particularly important, I think, to recognize is that while it works against mosquitoes, and it works quite well against mosquitoes, it is really well designed to prevent the bites of crawling things, things like ticks. And so let's explore, and we're going to take specifically the context of the deer tick in Canada as an example. It's, it's a lazy tick. It's a lazy tick that doesn't have wings. So how does it find us? How does it feed on us? So we talked about where you find them. For example, in forested areas along the edges of paths. And what they do there is they'll crawl up a bush, uh, maybe some long grass, a shrub, and they just wait. And they have eight legs if they're adults, and they kind of wave their, their, their legs around and they're waiting. It's called questing for you to walk by. And if you walk by, and you brush against the bush that happens to have the tick sitting on it, it grabs a hold of you and it starts crawling. Now, if you've only put, for example, topical repellent on your face or your hands and not on your clothing, which we typically don't do, that tick, for example, might crawl up your pants and in behind your pants and bite you. So we want you to wear repellent, topical repellent, but if it's on your hands and face, it ain't gonna get that tick because repellents work based on contact. So if you put permethrin into your clothing, you got it. You got it where it actually attaches to you. So you prevent it from actually accessing, for example, that area behind the pants or, or if it crawls up in behind your shirt or whatever. So it has actually very well targeted to these kinds of crawling insects. And, and, and hence, uh, in terms of the panoply of approaches we have for preventing the bites of ticks, I would argue it's the most important. Um, I can't actually remember what you, you asked to start. Well, Ian, so. a, I, got a, I got another question for you and then we'll go back to that. Um, can you tell us um, just a little bit about, um, so the, the tick and the mosquito react differently um, to the treated clothing and to permethrin. Can you just explain um, how each uh, reacts to the, uh, to the technology? So, so for mosquitoes in particular, um, what it kind of does is they, well, let's take even a step farther back. Uh, these things find us because we smell. Uh, a very large part of what they're doing is, is, is using things, particularly mosquitoes, uh, like carbon dioxide stuff that comes out in our breath and they find us from a distance. But as they approach us, um, they start using other cues and they land on us. Uh, if we're wearing treated clothing, uh, in effect, uh, they don't like it. It gives them hot feet and they're like, whoa, don't like that. And I use the analogy of it's like Tabasco sauce. Someone who's expecting a bland meal and a nice little bit of blood, no Tabasco sauce, lands on the clothing, like I'm out of here and it flies off, it's gone. Ooh. Now ticks, um, it kind of does the same thing, but not quite the same because they're crawling over the fabric and they're on it for a little bit longer. Um, for lack of a better way of describing it, it kind of makes them a bit stupid, a bit morbid. They, 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 they stop doing what they're doing and they either crawl off or they fall off. And indeed, if they're on the clothing for long enough, uh, it can kill them, uh, which is something that's a really good thing because we want to, 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 to deal uh, with ticks that are crawling on us. We'd prefer they didn't uh, crawl off mm -hmm. to eventually crawl on someone else. So the, the, it is absolutely different, different effects. Yeah. And the, um, is, it, is it true that, that, that ticks are actually, they, they're attracted to permethrin, where, whereas the mosquito is, is not? Um, it, it, that, that's a really interesting question. They're not really, a, I would argue that they're not really, well, I wouldn't even argue. They're not so much attracted to permethrin, uh, but what permethrin does to both of them, it, it, it makes them a little bit jittery. And so they start sometimes moving around quicker and, and you might look at the tick and say, geez, well, that's not so good. It's moving around quicker. It's trying to get away because um, it doesn't like that. So, so it wants uh, nothing to do with you. It wants nothing to do with the clothing. It's going to try to get out, off the clothing if it can. Uh, sometimes though, uh, you'll look at the tick and it's just sitting there, um, kind of stupid. Uh, for lack of a better way, it, it looks like it's had a few too many beers at their local shop, but that's because it's been incapacitated uh, by the permethrin. And, right. and so that's a good thing. Um, flick that sucker off and off you go, or crush it if you want to, but, but either way, 
you're achieving what it is that you want to do. And, and what you want to do is, is prevent that tick from accessing some, some skin and biting. Um, now I'm gonna leave this, this for a second. I'm gonna go off, off uh, on, on a tangent, although it's sure. not really a tangent, Dean. Uh, so we talked about a couple things that you can do to prevent bites, obviously topical repellents on your skin. Um, and these treatments of clothing with permethrin, I think are, are, are a game changer, particularly for individuals working in the bush all the time. Uh, that includes, for example, military personnel. For ticks and for Lyme disease specifically, uh, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease hangs out in the stomach of ticks. And so ticks are not like mosquitoes. They don't feed on you for 60 seconds. They'll feed on you for four or five, six or seven days, mm -hmm. which is nasty, it's gross, and they're yeah. big and bad at the end of it. But the point I wanna make here is, is that it takes a day or two for that pathogen, that Borrelia it's called, to move from that stomach of the tick into the salivary glands of the tick and into you. The tick's spitting into you the whole time it's feeding on you, by the way, which is also gross. But what that means is that in addition to these things, top of poor pelvis, treated clothing, you should check yourself regularly for ticks, specifically for Lyme disease. Because if you get those suckers off quickly, then they almost certainly will not have had a chance to transmit. So it's a combination of methods of which this treated clothing, I think, is, 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 is a crucial piece. Yeah, it's a... Uh... So, and the reason, the reason that, um, that we uh, don't have uh, workwear um, uh, as a, as a um, protective clothing yet is uh, the, there's a tremendous amount of, of um, testing and trials and investigation by the government. Um, so uh, it, it actually did take us um, 11 years um, to get approval um, uh, from the government to be able to um, produce the clothing, and um, Canadians can take you know can take um, uh, comfort in the fact that the amount of testing and the stringent um, way in which it was addressed um, uh, it means that it it is safe for people um, to wear. The one thing that um, has has uh, really caused us to have the problems and being able to deliver um, workwear is that we only have approval right now for applying it to polyester and 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 strictly in woven so uh, a t-shirt is a knit and a shirt that you're wearing is a woven and the structure is different and um, it, we also so we don't have approval for for knits either so polyester is not the greatest um, uh, fabric um, or yarn for uh, workwear. Um, most workers need to have um, a certain amount of, of uh, protection against flammability, whether, whether it's in their job description or not. It's, it is, um, and so therefore cotton works better. And, uh, and we don't have approval uh, for cotton. And the reason for that is, is the, um, the, the way the technology binds um, to the fabric, and it's the binder that's the the secret sauce, if you will, that makes all of this um, all of this work. But after over a hundred industrial washings, we still have ninety eight percent retention, only two percent degradation, which is which is quite amazing. And lots of reports and work have been done to show that it stays with cotton the same way. The only thing a cotton fiber um, sheds a little easier than a polyester fiber. Um, so the, the good news is that we found a way to, uh, to make a fabric for workwear, and we're very excited about it because we're, we're going to be introducing it um, next spring, spring 22. So now workers, um, you, you, you described all of those environments where people like to go and walk and enjoy and hang out outdoors. Well, just think about the, the people that work along uh, railroads that that uh, work along our hydro lines, uh, in our forestry, in our parks and rec, all of these people that spend time outdoors, they spend all day working in those environments and they have no protection at all. So we're, we're really excited to be able to, um, it'll be work shirts and work pants um, that we'll be introducing first. Um, we don't know if we're going to be able to deliver an overall and we're unable at this time to be able to deliver um, FR, so flame, flame resistant clothing. 
Um, but um, th those are obviously the next steps. One of the things that, that we've done uh, this year and we have in our stores is uh, we designed some gaiters um, to be worn and, um, and treated. And therefore you could, you could actually go for a walk in, in a pair of shorts uh, hiking boots and gaiters and be um, somewhat more protected, but also um, we do have shorts as well. But those gaiters um, we're introducing into the into the workforce because that will allow them to pull it over their work clothing, even though um, it may not give them all the protection they need. It, they still have their work clothing underneath the gaiters and are therefore protected. So, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I just want to explore just for a second uh, the evidence and again, the occupational setting. For treated clothing, this is clothing with permethrin on it. The best data, the best evidence uh, we have for protection against tick bites, the highest quality studies are in occupational settings. So this is a very important group. One comes, and you actually just reminded me about it in terms of the groups you were talking about, uh, from a group of, of park workers in the United States who were wearing uh, permethrin treated clothing uh, over several seasons. And in the real world, they saw a reduction of, of more than 80% uh, in tick bite, which is phenomenal in, in the real world. Wow. The other group, of course, is the military. And I have a, a colleague, Michael Feldy, who is a colonel with the German military. And of course, I'm, this is, I'm talking not from my, my, my defense role, but from an observational role on the evidence, but he's developed some really good data that shows that the treated clothing in an occupational setting in Germany prevents the bites of more than 90% of the ticks in Germany uh, that cause Lyme disease. So it has phenomenal effects in the real world. And I think it's very interesting, the point you just raised, Ian, about okay, right now we're not in a position necessarily to have a complete coverage of the body, but, but we're in a position to, for example, put gaiters on. And there's really nice evidence to indicate that if you can cover the lower legs, you can achieve significant protection against tick bites. And, and of course that makes sense. Uh, why does it make sense? Because where do they typically access us? It's from the foot or lower leg. So if you can get mm -hmm. permethrin coverage in that area, you're going to achieve some really important protection. So that, that actually is great news. Yeah, it's uh, um, right, right now we uh, the design the gaiters to be uh, for the casual wearer. And so we, we used uh, a product that is a quick dry product. And so um, what I noticed for the, for the working guy, while, while it'll help, um, I think the worker needs to have um, water repellency uh, because this fabric will will take on water, but it, it dries so quickly that it, it, you don't you don't really notice it. But the um, I think that water repellency for people that are walking through um, grass and 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 low brush and stuff that that do hangs on is and is wet and whatnot. Especially when you think about the areas that that the workers are in. Um, they're not manicured lawns and, and or, or paths, right? They're they're na they're natural, um, and so uh, we're now putting the. I'm going through the trials to be able to put the repellency um, and the um, uh, permethrin application on fabrics, and so far it's looking very promising. So we'll have a we'll have a ticket or a, sorry a gator next spring as well that that will deal with repellency. Um, water repellency as well as tick repellent. So I think uh, I think that's a that's a promising thing. And and ultimately, um, you, you talked about the foot, and we've been working um, for years and trying to get the approval to put it into socks. Because if you think about it, if you can get if you can get socks and you can get pants, or socks and gaiters and pants, um, as far as ticks go, you're pretty you know you you'd be pretty well protected. Obviously, they can you know, come in and around your, your neck and up your sleeve, depending on where you put your arm, depending on what you're working on. Um, I, I noticed the shirt that you're wearing is a light color. And I, I just want to talk about colors of fabrics here because the, the probably the most popular color for workwear would be black or navy. Um, and um, 
and then and then the dark browns and the dark greens. We stay away from those colors when we're building um, tick and mosquito repellent clothing because mosquitoes are attracted um, to darker colors, in particular dark navy, and um, ticks are dark. And so if you make the clothes lighter, you can see the ticks sitting on the on the um, on the clothing. And I I had a, a woman call me uh, really upset with me um, last year because she'd bought a pair of um, of our pants and uh, she was in uh, the Barrie area in Ontario and walking through the woods and and uh, and whatnot and came back to her um, her house and found a, a tick sitting on her one uh, pant leg. And uh, so she said, you know, how dare you sell stuff that says they're tick repellent? And I had a tick on me. And she said, uh, you know, it's gonna go to the government, and complain to the government. So I, I talked to her and I said to her, I said, um, she goes, thank goodness I bought a light pair of pants so I could see the tick. And I said, well, that's why the pants are light colored, the design so you can, you can see them and pick them off. But I told her if, if she had to walk through that same same uh, trail and path where she went without the protective clothing, she probably would have had dozens of ticks on her. But the minute the tick is on that fabric and stays for any length of time, and you mentioned it, it becomes incapacitated. So I said that the clothing actually did, did the job. And so all kinds of things to consider when you're building, building workwear. And when the buyer was selecting the fabrics, the first thing he did was go to a natural black and, and, uh, and navy and dark colors. And I said, no, we, we have to rethink this because in order to protect the worker, they need to be able to spot a tick. Um, if it's on the clothing and the darker it is, especially with workwear where it doesn't fit so tight, you get folds in the fabric, you know, you get, and you get, uh, you might be wearing something on top of it. Um, anyway, those are just some of the challenges that we deal with in, in trying to develop the clothing. And I'm assuming uh, the military went through, through the same um, uh, study and focus and, and uh, trying to figure out exactly the, uh, what colors to, to be able to uh, build in the clothing? Uh, to, to, to an extent, Ian, but at the end of the day for us, uh, of course, there's other uh, considerations when it comes to colors that, yeah, yeah. that have nothing to do with, with um, uh, mosquito attraction and, 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 and what ticks think are finding ticks. Um, because of course, uh, in military environments, there may be things with two legs that you're concerned about. So, so uh, patterns on the clothing are important. So certainly, I mean, ideally, uh, having light colored clothing uh, for identifying the ticks uh, is a, a useful feature. I completely agree. Uh, what I would say, though, um, and, and I think this is something to consider, um, well, not to consider, but what I'm trying to say is that mosquitoes and ticks will come to you whether or not you're wearing light or dark colored clothing. At the end of the day, if you're in the middle of the rhubarb, uh, in the middle of nowhere, and there's no other host to feed on, Mosquitoes don't care all that much whether you're wearing black mm. or whether you're wearing white. They just care that you're carrying some blood. Uh, so, you know, light colors are ideal, uh, but what's even more important is taking that integrated approach to whether it be mosquitoes or ticks, uh, wearing your treated clothing, covering up with, with, with topical repellents, if you can remember. And, and this is something we haven't touched upon, actually, and I think it's important uh, for, for, for those who work in the field. Um, <laughs> Again, I'm going to digress, okay? Um, this for a moment, and, and this is one of the reasons I like treated clothing. It's something we would call fire and forget. So I live in a country, I have 40 acres. I wear treated clothing uh, when I'm cutting trees and, and, and poop in my backyard. I was gonna say something else besides poop, but I'll say poop in my backyard. <laughs> I have a lot of mosquitoes. We have two big ponds, okay? Um, and, and for a lot of people that work outside who are certainly tougher than I am, um, do we respond or react to two or three or four or five or six or seven mosquitoes flying around us? Do we respond to 20 or 30 mosquitoes flying around us? No, we don't care. We slap them, we move on. It doesn't bother us. So do we put repellent on in that specific situation? No, we don't. Why? Because we're not bothered. For Canadians, for outdoor workers, for occupational settings in particular, we're hardwired not to be really bothered by low populations of mosquitoes. It's nuisance that is driving our decision-making. Sure, if there's a bazillion mosquitoes or black flies out there trying to bite us, we do something about it, right? We'll put some repellent on, but that's 
sometimes a bit of a last resort just because we're psychologically tolerant. When it comes to ticks, we're in a different situation. Now we're talking diseases. If we're hardwired to deal with nuisance, it's hard to remember to put repellent on, for example, for, top, for, for, for ticks and preventing disease. So permethrin treated clothing is really important in this respect because if you're wearing it, it lasts a very long time. You don't have to reapply. It's okay. essentially fire and forget. So it's on your back is protecting you. So this is something I think that is really important to, to recognize that, 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 that we have this overlay of, of, of our own personal behavior, our own personal tolerances that may be maladaptive, that may cause us harm in, in, in this new environment that includes ticks. So that is a real advantage to doing what you're talking about. It gets some protection on us where otherwise there would be very little protection. So kind of a spin-off question. So Ian talked about, you know, introducing uh, work, introducing the technology into workwear next year, but that still leaves this year. So if you could give advice to, to a worker who is in, you know, a possible environment where ticks are a risk, what would you, what advice would you give to them? And what would you tell them to do to help mitigate the risk? If, if, if they're in a situation where the current treated clothing doesn't or isn't applicable for, for, for Correct. the occupation yes. that they're, they're taking. Um, look, we're, we know we have a lot of people in, in that very situation. Uh, the, the advice, and, and there's good uh, direction uh, from the government of Canada, from provinces, would be to certainly uh, cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up, which they do. Another piece of advice, and, and we talked about this uh, very briefly, would be to, of course, carry out tick checks quite regularly, and not just when you get home. Uh, if you have time, have a quick look around when you've been in the rhubarb, particularly, particularly in, in, in the thickets along deer, deer paths. See if anything's crawling on you. Take it off as soon as you can. Uh, wear repellents, for sure, wear repellents. Uh, that makes sense. Now, we already talked about issues around light clothing and whether or not you can wear it, so that might not be applicable but seal up entrances to your body as best you can, right? So um, it doesn't look cool, but maybe tucking your, your pants in, uh, taping your pant legs, making sure you cinch up your buckle, uh, all would be useful things to do. Uh, when you get out of your occupational setting, um, maybe segregate your clothing. Uh, so ticks that are in your clothing right at that point uh, don't have an opportunity to, um, uh, to move on to you. Uh, wash your clothing regularly. Um, excuse me for a second about the <laughs> it's my nose um, and and when you get home of course shower uh, do tick checks um, and and I think it always helps to to even uh, check out your local public health or or whatever your medical advisor happens to be to see if they know whether there's any areas in in the region you're working in where you need to be concerned about ticks and finally, of course, you can put topical repellents on your hands or other exposed areas of skin. Uh, they work to prevent tick bites. Um, the caveat being the tick needs to encounter the repellent for it to work. So if they crawl up your unprotected leg over your clothing and behind your belt buckle, uh, repellent on your hands or your face is not going to work. Um, but if, if, if a tick accesses you through your arm or your hand or your face, uh, it will work. And certainly it will help to put off uh, nuisance mosquitoes. So um, in summary, cover up, check regularly, uh, wash your clothing, uh, use repellents. Is there a, uh, Stephen, is there a difference in uh, repellency? So I think we all know, um, you know, mosquito, tropical mosquito repellencies. Mm -hmm. um, we all have our, you know, opinions and, and the types and brands that we like to use. Is there a difference? in protecting against ticks from mosquitoes with topical repellencies? That, that's a great question. I would suggest that the depth of the data for mosquitoes, for reason, I mean, they, they tend to be the things we've been worried about the most in the past is, mm -hmm. is better than for ticks. So we have very high confidence, super high confidence that repellents work against mosquitoes. Now, I will say that there are different repellent ingredients available. And if I just can move off uh, for a moment, the, the, the permethrin uh, focus. Uh, so we have different repellents available in Canada. So we know about the, uh, there's some other ones. There are certain repellent active ingredients, in particular uh, products that contain DEET or products that contain something called a cardin, which is reasonably new to Canada. 
uh, that work uh, very well against mosquitoes. They provide long lasting protection. Uh, public health authorities in Canada, including the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, recommend these repellents preferentially because of their extended performance, uh, particularly where you're worried about disease. Mm -hmm. And it's also these repellents where there is greater depth of, 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 of evidence to indicate that indeed they also work, work against ticks. Um, so yeah, we know they work against ticks. Some repellents are better against ticks. We have even more confidence that, that they work against mosquitoes. And of course, as I've already uh, talked about, if that topical repellent isn't specifically in the area where the tick is accessing you, it's not going to work. Right, right, yeah. There's certainly no halo effect um, from anything that is uh, that is uh, uh, topical. That's correct. Um, when, it, when it comes to when it comes to ticks, I mean, it's um, uh, when you think about the the worker and the risk um, that that they're in. So it was it was bad enough a few years ago when they had to worry about um, West Nile or West Nile from uh, from mosquitoes. But but having to go in a work in an environment where you have to be concerned about catching Lyme disease and Lyme disease is such a, can be such a crippling disease. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly something that I hope we can, um, you know, branch out quickly. And once we, once we get started to be able to protect the worker, because there's with, the, with workers, there's all different types of requirements of clothing, you know, unlike the casual um, outdoor um, environment and uh, and uh, and people enjoying uh, the outdoors, um, the 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 requirements are basically to be covered and and keeping them as light and comfortable as can be because it's usually it's usually warm weather and you don't want to be all covered up. Um, so you know that's a that's a consideration. Um, that right now, clothing has to have a form of lining inside of it um, as, our, as our approval with Health Canada um, requires that, that we do that. In workwear, that's not such a, such a big deal because it can be designed um, quite well actually um, and, and be a benefit in Can keeping the point, outer layer of the work uh, clothing away from that's your skin. So that's, to uh, practice over that's there. a huge the benefit. Can do that. The, um, I need you to ask. But uh, um, when you think about um, the, the worker and all, all the different types of clothing and the amount of time that they spend in the environment, um, I, I really hope that we can uh, uh, advance this along. And obviously with help um, from you and, uh, and, and other people in the industry in, um, in getting uh, uh, PMRA and Health Canada to understand, um, I know they understand um, but it, there's, in my opinion, there's an urgency to, to deal with this. And, and so hopefully yeah. we can. To, Ian, I just, I, I, I mean, I'll pile on a little bit. I agree with you. And, and, and two things that we didn't touch on and I think are important are firstly, well, you actually alluded to them. Um, sometimes people have environmental concerns about what we're actually using uh, uh, to protect ourselves. And you very nicely made the point that permethrin is bound to the fibers in the clothing. Uh, the environmental impact of, of, of this clothing is, is you know, virtually nil. I mean, not only is it safe, not only do we have very high confidence because it's been approved for use by Health Canada, we're using a very targeted intervention that, that is consistent with environmental protection, number one. Uh, number two, for those, I think this is worth sharing with individuals who might be using this, you know, in a recreational setting, but are occupational workers right now. Something that I've quite often heard is, well, I mean, it says, you know, 100 washes. I, I, I don't want to wash my clothing so I can maximize how long it lasts. And you know better than I, but one of the things about this, this treatment is that uh, when you wash it, it does two things. It, it, it takes away dirt that might be covering up, if you will, the permethrin. So it becomes more active. Mm -hmm. And it remobilizes from, from, from that special sauce uh, that binds to the fibers a little bit more permethrin. So we actually want you to wash your clothing uh, because by That's washing your point. clothing, yeah, not 10 times a day, but uh, by washing it regularly, first, you don't stink uh, or you stink less. I mean, if you're me. And secondly, um, you, get, you, you actually develop a better tool for preventing bites by maintaining some level of cleanliness on your clothing. I think... 
uh, that's an important point to make to people because they, they naturally want to maximize the duration uh, of, of, of their clothing. They think yeah. that not washing it will do that. And, and that's not the case. Yeah. On the, on the, um, we do know that um, uh, clothing treated um, five years ago and worn in a casual environment. Um, so you're not, typically you're not wearing it in the winter. Um, and so, you know, your, your days are limited, but the performance of the, of the fabric and the technology is still the same as, as it was five years ago. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there certainly is a, um, a, a long duration of life, a lifespan, but a worker um, probably replaces their clothing every year anyway. And we see that um, in the mil military as well, Ian, where, where, you know, they tend to wear through their clothing if they're on an operation uh, before the actual permethrin repellency will, 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 will wear off. So you wear through things first. You don't uh, yeah. run out of permethrin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we're just about out of time, Adam. You have any other questions? Uh, we, I know we talked the whole time and we didn't give you much of a chance to, to ask, but. Oh, this was great. I appreciate the insight. And, and I think, Ian, the point you made about, uh, about workwear coming out in 2022, I think, is a critical message. I know yeah. we have lots of our customers that have been asking about it. So I think that's a, a huge win right there. But no, I, I think this was very valuable information. And I appreciate the time. Yeah. That's great. Well, Stephen, um, really, uh, really appreciate. Don't forget to send me your address, uh, Steve, so that I can uh, okay. I can send you those gators. Okay, that that'd be great. I, and I, I think this whole uh, occupational uh, clothing uh, aspect is a is a super big deal. Um, mm -hmm. They're a population that 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 you know we're, we're particularly concerned about. Um, and well, and where you think about Canada, we're very proud of our natural resources, right? So. We're proud of those natural resources, which also means that we have a lot of people working in them. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and more and more as this expands across the country, um, areas that weren't hitherto a problem become a problem. Um, yeah. to, a, to a certain extent, if we're dealing if in southern Canada, particularly central through to the east coast, it, it almost should be a, 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 for people working outside a standard yes. uh, of care, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Well, if we could get a, if we could get legislation put in place where it's, uh, where it's mandatory to wear, wear the clothing, that would be, uh, that would be awesome. Um, but we can't even get approval to build it. So it's like, <laughs> I guess one hurdle at a time. But anyway, it's been an interesting journey. We're now, we're now approaching, well, we're in 13 years. Well, the uh, first application was done in May of 2008. Um, I actually addressed it. With the government in uh, in the year of 2000, and there was a technology uh, out of Asia, but the um, the government told me at the time it would take 10 years, and I'm like, well, I don't have 10 years, and I never dreamed that it would actually take 10 years. As it turned out, the technology out of Asia wasn't a good technology, um, and, and uh, so we dropped that, and then it took another um, five six years. Um, before uh, a technology came along that that was um, very safe uh, for human wear, and and, um, and permethrin has been approved in in Canada for decades um, uh, in agriculture. Yep. Um, and, so and it's something that we're very used to, right? Treatment of lice, uh, treatment of other things. It's it's the same type of compound we use for wasps. Etc. So, so it's widely used. Um, it's been an odyssey and, and a long road for you guys. The one thing that, that I can't um, overemphasize is that if it gets through the PMRA, we have a high degree of confidence in its safety. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so it's it's a torturous road, but at the end of the day, uh, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that okay, now we're super confident in the safety. Yeah. Yeah. And if we're super confident in the safety, now we're in a situation where we can just look at the benefits and the benefits are, are profound um, mm -hmm. and really important benefits. And yeah. I think uh, your perseverance is, is, I mean, some, some might question your, your sanity, but thank goodness for, this. <laughs> for your perseverance, I, I have to say. Um, <laughs> completely different. Our, I know when I talk to you, and it's been a while, you know, our, our, our people, I mean, you had good sales with, with, with the... Yeah, yeah. Good, because I, I think it's uh, that's a big deal, and, and, it's and really they are they are um, 
sometimes thing, things, it's an interesting thing in the apparel industry. Sometimes trends take a while to grab on. And this is our, our third year of having clothing. And um, it's going to be our best year because people are, are definitely, uh, we're, able to, we're able to now, um, you know, it takes time to understand what people like and wear. And if we could get knits, that would be huge. Um, where we, um, you know, when it comes to um, pets, well, you put it into a bandana, um, the same as a human would wear a bandana, and you tie it around the dog's um, neck, and it and it helps um, uh, prevent ticks. Obviously, not all over the body, but then you can also build a dog coat, and that helps as well. Yep. Um, so anything you can do for the, you know, for the uh, um, for pets is a, is a big thing. But yes, people are really um, grabbing a hold of it. They're, they're starting to understand. But uh, I think there's also been obviously a lot more awareness about ticks. Um, and last year, you know, with COVID, um, the tick issue and Lyme disease kind of became secondary. Um, and if we, if we weren't dealing with COVID, um, Lyme disease would definitely be at the top of the list as a concern to Canadians. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I find it interesting right now, uh, and we'll see if this persists. In the COVID world, the number of people that are out using green spaces have, has increased tremendously. A very good thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm an outdoor guy, so I cross-country ski, I cycle, I paddle, I do a bunch of stuff. And, and um, the, the traffic is... is I don't know if it's doubled or trebled or quadrupled, but it is it is substantial. Yeah. And, and these are the very places where you find ticks. And, and, and this traffic is going to continue, I hope. I think that's a really good thing for Canadians. So yeah, no, it, it will. It's only going to get better. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm glad to hear that because for the longest time, I mean, as an outsider looking in to what you guys have done, we've wanted this in, in Canada for, for Canadians. Um, it's been yeah. accessible for some time to military personnel. Yeah. But we've always we've always thought this is a major gap, and and I think the tick situation and the Lyme situation uh, just uh, focused uh, a lot of people on the importance of of of, of um, preventing bites. Yeah. Uh, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I have to run. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Um, Adam, thanks. Danielle, thanks.